Thanks, Kyle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Future of Bitcoin. I'm here with Manib Ali, co-creator of Stacks. Welcome, Manib. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to chat with you. So everybody, the title of this talk is The Future of Bitcoin. And I actually really love this just because the future of Bitcoin is at this huge inflection point right now. So Maneeb, assuming you agree, what do you think the future of Bitcoin previously looked like and how has it been changing? Yeah, so I agree with you. I think like in the last five years, this is probably the most exciting time for Bitcoin. And, and it's for a couple of reasons. I think one is that we saw more innovation and activity directly on the Bitcoin L1. So we saw Ardinals, which, you know, uh, you know, basically like Bitcoin NFTs. And, and Ardinal saw enough like interest and demand from both users and developers that the trading volume for Ardinals actually flipped Ethereum and Solana. And, 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 it remain, and it remains there like pretty consistently. That's a pretty interesting stat. Like within six months, out of nowhere, Bitcoin NFTs came, came online and now they're like one of the largest uh, NFT trading volumes uh, in the industry. So that was like really interesting to see. And that also uh, sort of like proved the demand for Bitcoin block space and Bitcoin fees started going up. That, that so, sort of like triggers uh, a, uh, a renewed interest in Bitcoin L2s. Because I think everyone sort of like, you know, theoretically uh, gets the idea that Bitcoin L1 is not going to be the place where you use your Bitcoin uh, because it's going to be very expensive, it's going to be slow and so on. So theoretically, I think Bitcoin L2, the idea has been around for a while, but until the, the gas fees on the L1 really started spiking recently, I think people weren't feeling the pain point. So as soon as like the pain point became very, very real and it's, it's like right there in your face, I think that renewed interest in Bitcoin L2s, which is a work that you know, we've been doing at Stacks for a while. Uh, and we started seeing like tons of other projects like trying to build Bitcoin L2s, which I think is really, really good for Bitcoin as a whole. And we can, we can get into some of the more details there. Yeah, I'd love to. But before we do, I do have one question because I'm sure as you've seen, ordinals and also BRC20s have been pretty controversial with you know, people like core developer Luke Dasher saying that ordinals are an attack on Bitcoin. And I know, you know, you're a proponent of ordinals and all this activity. So, you know, if you were to kind of speak to that part of the Bitcoin community, like what message would you have for them? Yeah, so first of all, I think I'd like to uh, point out that Luke is just one person, right? Luke is one person and he's had like controversial opinions on things all the time. So I would separate him out from other core developers. Uh, a lot of the core developers who are actual, you know, sort of like very active maintainers uh, right now, they're pretty supportive of Arduino. They see that, you know, the chain, chain is open and permissionless and people can use it however they want. In fact, a bunch of core developers are actually doing work that helps things like Ordinals, because Ordinals uh, was almost like stress testing the Bitcoin L1 network. And there were some edge cases that were showing in like the mempool or some other parts of the Bitcoin software that the core developers are actively working. On. So if they thought that this is an attack on Bitcoin or something, like they wouldn't be doing the work that actually uh, sort of like supports like this, this type of traffic. So I would just point that out. It's one person. Uh, and I think that they, uh, any of the attempts to stop ordinals have miserably failed in the market as well, right? Like miners continue to, to mine them because they're collecting fees. Uh, they are sort of like gaining more and more traction. So I would, I would say that the free markets sort of like speak louder than anything else. Like people can have their opinions, their individuals. But I think what we should look at is overall, the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin market is actually fully supporting ordinals and there's no resistance, right? Like it's, 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 a, it's a technology that's winning in the market. So in terms of all this activity around um, layer twos and just uh, this sort of renaissance in Bitcoin, you actually recently tweeted, Bitcoin L2s redirect intellectual capital developers and VC capital to the Bitcoin ecosystem. This will end up helping Bitcoin Core with a pipeline of new devs. This will also help mature APIs, indexers, dev libraries, and tools for Bitcoin. Can you elaborate on that? You know, talk a little bit about, yeah, what you're seeing in terms of this activity. Yeah, so I think um, I'll, I'll sort of like classify the time between like 2017 and last year, 2023, almost like five years as a time where a lot of attention actually went away from Bitcoin, from, from, the, from our industry. Right? Like, and, and Bitcoin was sort of like, hey, this is this passive asset. Yes, it's sort of like money, 
but you just hold it and there's nothing much you can do. But most of the interesting development, most of the uh, like you know new funding rounds, new R and D efforts, they were actually happening in the rest of crypto. Uh, and I think the the thing that I'm most excited about is for our industry to mature. Like we have to all agree on certain standards. For example, if BTC is clearly winning as money, which is I think most people would agree to that, that BTC the asset is the thing that's winning as money or as a store of value uh, in our industry. So if everyone sort of like agrees that, hey, BTC is money, BTC is where we sort of like, you know, store our savings uh, and, and so on, then converging on that and then building on top of Bitcoin, building all the different types of applications, instead of that getting fragmented on all these other disconnected networks, building them on top of Bitcoin actually makes a lot of sense. It helps our industry mature. I think one analogy would be that uh, on the internet, once everyone converged on TCP IP, and everyone's like, hey, that's the protocol that nobody wants to change. If someone today wanted to make a change to TCP IP, people would freak out. They're like, no, that thing runs, you know, like all these other applications and, and, and you know, billions of users on top. Don't change that. There are other layers built on top of TCP IP on the internet. So I think Bitcoin is like that. So Bitcoin can actually start to ossify, but that doesn't mean that we uh, there isn't going to be innovation around Bitcoin. I think most of that stuff is actually going to happen in L2s, which are sort of these uh, extensions to Bitcoin or other layers on top of Bitcoin. And they can have functionality similar to a Solana or a Ethereum and so on. And the type of applications people were seeing, they would basically experience those applications with BTC as the asset. So if you want to participate in a decentralized lending protocol, uh, you can participate with BTC. If you want to do, you know, trading against stable coins, you can do that with BTC in a decentralized way and so on. So I think this switch of, and, and there's already market evidence. I think so many startups are now getting funded for seed or even series A stage uh, funding rounds that what wasn't happening before. So many developers are coming in and there's this sentiment, like I meet so many people who are like, yes, I was working in name your ecosystem that is not Bitcoin. But at heart, I'm actually a Bitcoin. I always believe in Bitcoin. I hold Bitcoin. And now these people get excited that now they can actually work in the Bitcoin ecosystem as well, because these opportunities are opening up that just simply weren't there like two years ago. All right. So now let's dive into these different layer twos. Because, you know, for a while now, we've already had things like Lightning, we've had Stacks, but then there's kind of, uh, you know, several new ones. And I think they can actually be divided into multiple different categories. So do you kind of want to give an overview of the landscape? Yes. So I think um, taking a step back, I would say uh, that Liquid actually deserves a lot of credit for being sort of like the first L2. And Liquid follows a federation model. Right. So there are a lot of sort of like trust assumptions that you're trusting the federation that is running the nodes, or they have the keys to the multi-sig wallet, uh, how you're transferring BTC. So that's like the first generation or sort of like the one end of the spectrum. And I think Ethereum has, has actually done a lot of research on L2s uh, since 2017 uh, onwards. And state channels is something that, you know, early on the Ethereum community looked at as well. Uh, so there have been some R&D on state channels and Lightning is effectively a state channel. So it's in that category. Lightning doesn't have like a full ledger. Uh, it doesn't have like full VMs. You can't write smart contracts. It's a state channel that sort of like settles on, on Bitcoin and is really uh, focused on payments. And uh, the good thing about Lightning is that it's very trustless. So in terms of, again, if you look at a spectrum, the most sort of like trustless thing would be that a user can unilaterally withdraw funds out of the L2, right? Don't need to trust anyone else. I can just send a transaction directly on the Bitcoin L1 and I can take my BTC out of the L2. Lightning actually qualifies for that. There are some sort of attacks that can happen, right? But putting, putting that aside, uh, I think uh, Lightning basically is extremely trustless on that spectrum. And Liquid would be the other side of it, right? It's a federation and you are completely trusting the, the signers on the multi-sig for withdrawing your, your BDC. And then there is like things in the middle, like for example, the stuff that we are building uh, with, with Stacks called SPDC, uh, it has a set decentralized group of signers and you need an honest majority of those signers to process the withdrawal from the L2 back, back to the L1. And then there are things like BIPVM, which we'll get into more, that sort of like drastically lower that trust assumption. So instead of M of N, meaning honest majority, it becomes one of N. So only one honest party in the set is all that's needed 
uh, for withdrawing your assets out of out of the L2, and that honest party could be you yourself, right? So it's a, actually a, I act, actually think that the difference between fully quote unquote trustless and one of n is actually pretty little uh, from a from a practical perspective. And I think that was also one of the things. So a lot of people on in Ethereum and and, and other places they would criticize Bitcoin L2s as hey these are not really L2s because you can't you know uh, unilaterally withdraw your assets because on Ethereum that's possible. Ethereum has full smart contract uh, language at the L1, so you can build those systems. And I think my answer to that is even honest majority withdrawals from a commercial and practical perspective, like they 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 can work. But then things like BitVM completely change the game. I think that was the final sort of like missing piece because the, the cool thing about BitVM is you don't need any changes to Bitcoin L1. It, BitVM can be deployed without modifying Bitcoin at all. And I think that's key because a lot of people are skeptical about the timelines uh, that it would take for making any change to Bitcoin. So if your L2 depends on a change to Bitcoin L1, then people are less interested in it because they're like, hey, this is theoretical. This is not going to happen until Bitcoin can adapt. But because of BitVM, and now that sort of like criticism goes away, uh, you don't need any changes for, for, for BitVM. BitVM is sort of already there. There's still some you know, uh, work happening before it becomes practical. I think it would require like six months to a year. But it's there. It's basically straightforward at this point. There's no like breakthrough needed. It's just like more engineering work that needs to go into BitVM. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about BitVM. As far as I understand, I guess it's sort of an optimistic rollup for Bitcoin. So computation can happen off chain, but then be verified on Bitcoin. And I saw that there was a little bit of back and forth where um, I think people assumed that it would sort of create kind of like an Ethereum-like environment on Bitcoin. And then the creator said he didn't necessarily see it being used that way, but more like as an improvement on Lightning. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you think it might be used for or, or you know, where you see the future with that? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very exciting, right? So basically the key discovery with BitVM was that so Bitcoin's existing script is very limited on, by, on, 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 by design, on purpose, uh, so that the attack security attack vector is uh, pretty small. And what, what uh, Robin uh, Linus discovered was that you can break any program into logic circuits. So think of logic circuits as like, you know, the lowest level uh, way of, of expressing a computer program. And just try to run the logic circuits directly using the Bitcoin existing opcodes, right? And that works. So it's almost like discovering that Bitcoin is accidentally Turing complete, right? But, but obviously that, that is very, very inefficient. Most of these programs are off chain. Uh, so whoever wants to run the program, the, the, most of the logic is off chain and just the verification and the proofs, they happen on the L1, right? So people who are more familiar with Arbitrum, the fraud proofs model, I think that's probably the best analogy that if you think of Arbitrum L2 as the off-chain component, like whatever you're doing is, is off-chain, um, and in BitVM, the off-chain component is a little bit different. It's not, not like Arbitrum, but just as an analogy, the important part is that there can be fraud proofs. So BitVM basically supports, quote-unquote, fraud proofs on the Bitcoin L1. So whatever computation you were doing, maybe maybe the, the thing that you're trying to prove is that I actually have capital in an L2 and I want to withdraw it. And the bridge was implemented with BitVM. So you can actually have a fraud proof that a Bitcoin L1 will execute and enforce. And I think that's that's the key part, right? So that given that these computations, because they have to be expressed as logic gates, they're very inefficient. I don't think people would be running general purpose programs using BitVM, but very targeted specific things. Uh, most importantly, I think a bridge, like a L1, L2 bridge, it just needs to be built once and then deploy it. And most people would use it only, only under like catastrophic scenarios, right? Like, and, and so that's how I see the most like commercial uh, use cases of, of BPM. Okay, so really targeted things like bridges. So then it would kind of be, like, would it be limited in the number of different types of applications that you would see, you know, flourish from that? I think I do think like you know I should we should never underestimate uh, you know ideas that humans can come up with. So I'm pretty sure people would do some unexpected things. But at least for me, the thing that I'm the most excited about is the type of functionality that we would 
won from Bitcoin L1 by, for example, some op codes that we wanted to introduce. I think uh, ZK, ZK rollups is another example that people wanted to have, you know, some sort of a, uh, op, op ZK verify or, or whatever, or start verify op code. You can almost like build these type of primitives in BitVM without requiring any changes and then try them out, right? And see like commercially how much interest there is, how do these things work? And then once you have the data, you can then sort of like go to the Bitcoin community and say, hey, look, there's so much uh, usage that we are seeing in L2s uh, using BitVM. And now I think maybe it's time to introduce that as a opcode because that would make things a lot more efficient uh, instead of relying on BitVM for, for executing these things. So I think that's where my mind goes. Uh, but people are playing around with all sorts of things. I've even heard that someone is running a Linux kernel using BPF, right? At an experimental stage, but it's 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 you can you can build anything. You can build anything with it. Okay. Well, there's I mean, so many layer twos. When I went to do this, the research for this, I thought I knew of a number. And then when I did more research, I was like, oh, it's like two or three times what I even knew about. So I'm just gonna throw out a bunch of names. I saw Arc Babylon, which is I guess something related to Cosmos, Botanics, um, Citrea, which is a ZK rollup, Interlay, which involves Polkadot, Mint Layer, which sort of DeFi, RGB, Threshold Network. Like, there were just so many. So I don't know if there's any particular, I mean, obviously then you have stacks, but I don't know if you want to call out any of these other ones that you're especially excited about or or why. Yes. Yeah, so I think the thing I'm excited about is tons of experimentation, which is amazing, right? So I would say even a year ago, um, I was sort of like the more lonely voice in the industry trying to educate people about Bitcoin L2s and why they're important and why, why I think that they could be a very, very big deal. And now it's a category, right? If there are 20 plus or 30 plus projects doing something, it automatically sort of like becomes a category in the industry, just like, you know, alt L1s or faster competitors to Ethereum was a category. And then capital comes in, developer comes in, people build like their different designs and then they go and compete in the market. So I think that's that's going to happen in the Bitcoin L2 space. I, I, uh, Big, Ethereum L2s, for example, are already like a 70 billion market, right? And I think Bitcoin L2s are likely going to be larger than that. Like my, my guess is like 100 billion plus market. And when people see that, then they see commercial opportunities and they want to come in and, and try to pursue them. And I think that's how free markets work. So my stance here is, uh, I think some people have this gut reaction that they become very uh, cynical or they start criticizing some of the projects that, oh, no, you're not really an L2 because you're doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, I think my response is a little bit different. I think my definition of an L2 is very broad. What I care about is BTC is being used as the asset, right? So if BTC is being deployed in applications, even better if BTC is the gas asset, that is something that, you know, uh, Stacks is, for example, look into it as well. People can just pay gas fees. There's a proposal out there. People can pay gas fees in BTC. BTC is, is the primary asset that is getting deployed in smart contracts and DeFi applications and so on. To me, that's a Bitcoin L2. And then you get into how security works and security is like bridge security and then your consensus. Right. And there are different models and let people experiment with all sorts of different things. Be very upfront about uh, sort of like what is your design and what are the what are the trade offs. So th that's sort of like exciting. Uh, I, I would typically when I, I would look at an L L2, I would look at three things in, in general. One would be bridge security. So I think one end of the spectrum is that liquid is sort of like, you know, a, a federation. You're trusting the multi-sig signers. Uh, and that's the bridge security. And then on uh, on the other end, you have something like Lightning, which is you know completely non-custodial in a way. And I think BitVM to me is actually pretty close to completely uh, non-custodial. Some people might disagree with that, but I think one of end security for, for a practical perspective is very, very close to being completely trustless. Uh, and a bunch of these projects that might have been working on other designs before, now are thinking about how do they use BitVM uh, for their bridge. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these projects end up using BitPM um, in the next year or two. Uh, I'm already seeing proposals in Stacks, like the Stacks bridge is going live that has honest majority sort of like assumptions. And there's already R&D work that's popping out that, hey, how do we use BitPM for doing that? So that that's how I, was, I would categorize it. And then there are different ways of doing consensus, right? And over there, uh, my sort of like, uh, 
takeaway is because Bitcoin itself is slow and we have real world sort of like experience of doing that, the existing version of Stacks runs at Bitcoin speed and it's a big pain point for users. Like they're waiting for 10 to 40 minutes for a single confirmation. So I think any, any L2 that is relying on Bitcoin L1 for, it might be a ZK rollup or you're, uh, or you're relying on finality to come from Bitcoin L1, it's a trade-off against UX. So these L2s would either discover or maybe early on would realize that they really need to work on uh, faster confirmations internal to the L2. I think practically that's the thing that matters actually more. Sure, there are different ways Bitcoin can actually give you the security guarantees, but practically I think the faster confirmations is the thing uh, that's going to matter. And Stacks is already working on it, right? Like our Nakamoto release is focused on uh, you know, giving people like really fast confirmations internally. And then other L2s are going to come up with their own ways of like, how, how do they do it? Do they not have any internal confirmations? Are they just relying on Bitcoin? It's a trade-off because maybe for security, going to Bitcoin for full execution is actually better in a, in a ZK roll-up style, but maybe you're losing out on speed and, and so on. And so I would say, and the third thing would be, um, you know, programming environment, right? So Stacks has a safe programming language called Clarity. But now we are, uh, are sort of the ecosystem is launching Wasm support, which opens up potential for other types of runtimes as well, including uh, Solidity. But some people would do EVM, some people would do Rust. There would be all sorts of experimentation, and I think those are the three main dimensions on which I would try to classify the L2s. And I think I think experimentation is great. Let people come in, let them build all sorts of different things, just like what happened on Ethereum. There are like 20, 30 different L2s there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some people who say that they expect a future in which we have 10,000 L2s um, or, or uh, what, you know, rollups. So, you know, you referenced the Nakamoto upgrade, which I guess is going to happen in April on Stacks. And you mentioned that the block time will be shortened um, to five seconds, at, at least on Stacks. And then um, you're also going to be instituting 100% finality. And I was curious for both of those, like how you're achieving that. Yes, so I think uh, basically the biggest upgrade that's happening is that right now the current version of Stacks, the Stacks blocks have are one to one with Bitcoin blocks, right? And you're sort of like breaking that correlation, and we can have cryptographic proofs that time is passing after after a Bitcoin block, right? So whatever frequency there is, and 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 now once you once you have those primitive in place, you can actually keep keep upgrading and keep improving the the, the latency as well, right? So uh, that's that's sort of like the key breakthrough that we can tell time, like cryptographic proofs of time passing between Bitcoin blocks. And then we have a much faster consensus. So there are validators that are sort of like signing these blocks in, at a much faster speed. And then when a Bitcoin block arrives, then everything settles on Bitcoin, right? So you get the, let's say you were trying to do a BTC transfer on the L2, you're probably paying like cheaper ga uh, gas fees and you get a faster confirmation. So today, I think something like $700 million is locked on stacks. So it's that capital that is signing off on like, okay, we sign off on the transaction and it's not going to reverse. But as soon as the Bitcoin block arrives, then the security guarantee is Bitcoin finality, right? So, so for someone to reverse the transaction, they would actually have to go and attack the Bitcoin L1 chain and try to reorg Bitcoin blocks. So transaction ordering and finality come from Bitcoin, which I think from a practical perspective is really great because if a user wanted to do an L1 transaction, they have to wait for a Bitcoin block until they get a single confirmation. The L2 user would have the same experience. They would just get the faster confirmation, stuff goes through, but as soon as the Bitcoin block comes, their security guarantee is now comparable to the Bitcoin L1 transaction that you were doing. Huh, okay, interesting. Um, so now I want to ask a slightly contentious question. Um, I'm sure you've heard this kind of thing before, but you know, why, why is it that people would want to do all this on Bitcoin when a lot of this functionality already exists on Ethereum or Solana or any of these other smart contract chains? Yeah, I think, I think the first answer is that, uh, imagine there's a trillion dollars of BTC capital that is just sitting there. Like you look at ETH. Uh, a lot of ETH is actually actively deployed in smart contracts and applications and is earning yield and so on. So I think it's just a market force. Like imagine if even, you know, I think 25% of ETH is deployed or something. That's at, at Bitcoin's current market cap, not future market cap, current market cap, that's $250 billion of capital that's just sitting there for developers to come in and sort of like do interesting things with it. So I think one is just the market pull. Uh, 
uh, of like how large uh, a capital-based BTC is. And I think the other thing is Bitcoin has established itself as the most sort of like uh, secure chain, as the number one brand name, even in terms of active addresses, Bitcoin is up there. Like it has the most number of active users on 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 daily basis. Sometimes Solana flips it, but you know Bitcoin is up there. So it's a very large user base. And I think Ordinals sort of like showed us that people value their NFTs more on Bitcoin. When it's secured on Bitcoin, they value it more because Bitcoin's block space has that premium. And I think same thing with uh, BTC DeFi as well. So we have seen like several false, you know, sort of like uh, starts to Bitcoin DeFi when Bitcoin DeFi weren't really there with Taproot, but it was over-marketed. But I think when, when it actually happens, when people are able to deploy BTC capital into all of, all of these applications that we've seen on Solana or Ethereum, I think users are just going to uh, sort of like intrinsically know that BTC is more secure and more valuable. So these applications can actually gain a larger capital base, more users and so on. And I think that's, that's the exciting part. So, you know, earlier when we talked about the inflection point in Bitcoin, what I find so fascinating is that all the news has been about the ETFs recently, and yet that didn't really come up. Um, but it's been a big catalyst to price. And then also coming up, we have the halving. And I just, you know, thought, um, I, you know, I, I wanted to hear kind of your thoughts on where the future of Bitcoin is going when you look at like that whole picture of kind of TradFi, the tech happening, and then the software just chugging along and doing what it does every four years. Yes. So I, I think um, basically the, the way I think about this is some of the more like larger institutions and uh, especially uh, institutions that are more risk averse, they sometimes stay out of an industry until it matures to a certain level. So that's why I think uh, Bitcoin becoming clearly the, the, the only asset that is money or in some ways becoming a standard for doing settlements is actually a really good thing for adoption, right? Like, because once Bitcoin becomes a standard for, for settlement and BTC is the asset in which most things are happening, then the more risk averse, mature institutions, they're like, okay, this industry is actually maturing enough that there are standards emerging and we can come in because they, they want to come and build something that's going to last like 50 years, 100 years, whatever. They don't want to build on something too experimental that disappears in two years, three years, four years or, or so on. So I think um, I look at all of this as like being very, very good for Bitcoin. Now, Wall Street is now plugged into the Bitcoin ecosystem through the ETF. Like ETF is sort of like an API interface for Wall Street, right? Like now they'll take all of their uh, traditional you know, products and they will start offering them for Bitcoin and so on. And that's going to have a lot of uh, demand on BTC, the asset. And I think L2s, interestingly, are going to have a very similar effect on Bitcoin demand as well. Like imagine something like 3% of uh, BTC is already sitting under ETFs um, and a very, very small amount of BTC is actually sitting on any bridge or any L2, like a very tiny amount. And I think that's going to change. Uh, where these L2s would have a ton of demand for Bitcoin, Bitcoin capital would would basically uh, sort of like move into these L2s, just like it's moving into ETFs. Uh, but in the L2s, it's actively deployed. So people are earning yields. People are sort of like doing active trading in a decentralized way. They're they're getting liquidity. Like a lot of Bitcoins, Bitcoiners like myself, we don't like to sell our Bitcoin, right? But we wouldn't mind getting some liquidity uh, by locking up Bitcoin in, in a decentralized smart contract and getting partial liquidity uh, for you know our daily expenses or whatever, right? Like we, I don't want to get a tax hit. I don't want to sell my Bitcoin, but I, I'm a human in the end, and I want some liquidity for 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 expenses this year, for example. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously one of the most popular use cases on Ethereum. Um, you know, when I asked the question about other possible layer twos, I did mention a ZK rollup, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on privacy coming to Bitcoin. Yes, I think that's a that's a pretty big thing. I do think there are some challenges as well, because one of the reasons Bitcoin has been getting um, institutional adoption is that it's not completely private and, and anonymous, right? There's There are certain level of uh, public information that people can track. So I, I do think that technically a bunch of these L2s will it's just inevitable that they will end up doing shielded transactions and more private transactions with Bitcoin. But I think it's going to have a little bit tension with this idea that Bitcoin uh, is, is sort of like has traditionally never had very strong privacy solutions. Obviously, there are things like CoinJoin and others, but not at the level of, of like ZK mixers, for example. 
Yeah, well, we'll have to see uh, what happens with all that. Well, Mani, this has been so fascinating. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Awesome. Always great talking to you. Yes.